war in Vietnam ended officially in January last year. American troops were seen to go home. Mr. Nixon said it would at last. And those of us who had reported the war through its longest years also went home. For as a news story, the whole boring mess of Vietnam finished. So much for the fantasy. Since the Paris Agreement and the so-called ceasefire, more than 70,000 soldiers and civilians have been killed in Vietnam. But this film is not about the day-to-day -day slaughter of soldiers. It's about the continuing and growing and forgotten suffering of the Vietnamese people in what is still, almost incredibly, America's war. On the streets, the Americans appear to have gone. They haven't. The Pentagon has thousands of men in Vietnam. They include senior officers, pilots and technicians, medals. American military headquarters is now called the Defense Attaché's office and functions almost exactly as it did before the Paris Peace Agreement. But the majority of Americans in Vietnam, without whom the war could not go on, are servicemen who have transferred directly to the payroll of some 60 American companies on contract to Washington. Some of them have been here eight and ten years, you know. Uh, their contract normally runs on when they're working for a contractor, uh, usually run a year, but uh, most of the people have been here a number of years, three years or over. People who have transferred from the Army and then gone on to contract work. Many of, them, many of them in that category. What were you doing in the Air Force? I was working on an electronic countermeasure system. What, what is that in plain uh, language? In plain language, that means uh, um, a device that will let you know uh, that radar is being look, is looking at you, yeah. and it will let you know that that is happening. A surveillance device. Basically a surveillance yeah. device. Yeah. Yes. And, that, and that's, the, that's the extension of that is the kind of work you do now. Yes. So, what would happen if the Vietnamese didn't have the surveillance assistance, didn't have the American assistance now? I'd say within a week to possibly a month, um, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would probably overrun this country very easily. Who are the American pilots that fly the planes first and train them? Are these military people? No, civilians. Civilians <coughs> from uh, these aircraft uh, companies, companies like uh, Lockheed and uh, the, uh, Northrop. 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 Yeah, they, yeah. They, they build the F-5. GE makes the engine for it, and um, they they know the aircraft. So they fly the aircraft until they can train the Vietnamese, yeah. and they will uh, stay over here. I don't know how long a six months contract or whatever it may be. Big Will Plunkett, a nice guy from Atlanta, Georgia, has been the man from Monkey Mountain since he transferred from the Air Force to Kentron, Hawaii Limited, a defense contractor. Monkey Mountain overlooks the city of Da Nang and is a vital power plant, radar and surveillance base, equipped by the U.S. Air Force and run by Will Plunkett. You just come and go. The man from Monkey Mountain, this is your very private domain up here overlooking Da Nang. What are the installations here? What kind of work do you do? Well, I'm, um, right now I'm an uh, advisor to the VNAV power plant. Uh -huh. and, um, they have the radar up here for um, air traffic control and different things. And they also keep an eye up north, you know. Yeah, in North but Vietnam. There has been... Uh, Quite a few penetrations down here of North Vietnamese aircraft. But a power plant controlling what? Controlling military installations in Da Nang itself? Right. So you're a very vital man. Do you think without you it, uh, it could be run effectively? Um, yeah, I think without me the card game wouldn't be any good. You know? I wish there was more appreciation shown on the Vietnamese part. We stand uh, quite a flow of this, this was the starting point for the Chinese takeover of all Southeast Asia, which hasn't stopped and won't stop for years. But had it not been stopped here, this part of the country or this part of the world and these people would have been as isolated as China is today and has been for over 20 years. And it wouldn't stop there. There would be Taiwan and Japan and then anything else that they felt that they could just sort of, uh, like a plague, go over the top and isolate to become their people, and that's what would have happened. But we stood up to them, we stopped them, 
we put the fear of God in more or less speak, and uh, hopefully this has stemmed the flow now. I think it was all worth it. Definitely. Definitely. Every, every, every limb that was lost and every individual sitting back in a veteran's hospital now, and every death, it's, I think it's all worth it. I surely do. Last month, President Nixon asked the Congress for $2 billion in aid for Vietnam. Most of it will be military aid. Less than a half of 1% will help civilians maimed by the war. These people are lucky, for there are still only three hospitals for civilian amputees in Vietnam, and this one at Quang Nai, run by the Quakers, is the best. Nothing has changed here. They still make their own limbs and wheelchairs, and they still can't meet the demand. Most of our injuries, war-related injuries, are our mines. And second are grenades, third are artillery and gunshot. But primarily, our biggest problem is kids stepping on mines. And that is the same problem that existed in 1972. And I think it's very interesting to note that that's covered in the peace accords. And the peace agreement, is, I think it's Article 7 or Article 15, I'm not really sure which says that 15 days, at, oh, there's where the 15 comes in, 15 days after the ceasefire, um, all mines will begin being cleared. And we have seen nothing um, that, that has happened in that area at all. And this is, of course, over a year after the ceasefire now. This kid was injured last September, and um, his father sells gasoline. And when the two sides were fighting, some stray bullets came into his house, and. The gasoline was set off, and this kid was very, very badly burned. He not only has burns on his face, but also on his legs and his feet. You can see that his feet are pretty badly contracted. He probably has trouble walking. It's a very severe problem for kids like this. There just isn't the kind of plastic surgery around to take care of them. How old is he? Seven years old. He looks very much in shock still, doesn't he? He's a pretty sad kid. Her name is Tung Win. And what happened to her? She was out taking care of cows, and she stepped on a mine. <laughs> it's the same old story, isn't it? Yes. And she's lost her right leg below the knee. She may be an AK. Let's look. Yeah, below the knee. That's so right. She, she probably stepped on one of those little foot bones. Yeah. Em, 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 yeah. Okay. The, the man behind us, she's not giving any answer, and the man behind us said, uh, the mine exploded. How is she supposed to know? She didn't see it. Of course, kids will go on stepping on grenades and mines for years to come, I imagine. Right. And uh, that's a, a new problem now. We see a lot of that happening now. Uh, How old is Jinti High? She's 16. She was out cutting um, a row or vegetables. You know, so there's a green vegetable that grows that people eat here a lot. She was out cutting that to gather for her family, and she stepped on a mine. These were the strictly anti-personnel, anti as they called them. Oh, yeah. Not Might not. flatten a front wheel on a bicycle, but the thing it's best at doing is taking off feet. Mm. Julie, how do civilian casualties now, in the second year of the peace, match up with casualties in the last year of the war? Well, year, in the year 1972, which was the last, quote-unquote, the last year of the war, uh, about 65% of our patients were war-related. That means directly war-related, a mine or a, a, a shot. 61% of our patients in 1973 were war-related. If you're in the midst of the war here, why do we still have a war now, in the second year of the so-called peace? I guess the biggest thing for me is that American aid continues here. And as long as the arms flow into Vietnam at the, at the rate they're, you know, at the rate they're flowing in, people are going to go on getting shot, mines are going to go on being laid, new mines are going to go on being laid, and people are going to go on being injured. As far as I'm concerned, there should be an end to, to all military input into this country. How many Americans are still here in South Vietnam, directly or indirectly involved in the war effort? Uh, the uh, last statistics that I saw released by the American uh, embassy, and I think that uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, quite uh, accurate, is about uh, 6,500 uh, all counted. But Dr. Kissinger has said it's only 2,300. Client and master cannot agree. Unofficially and reliably, there are 15,000 Americans still in Vietnam. How many soldiers and civilians have been killed on both sides since the Paris Peace Agreement? 
Well, the, if you want the uh, total, I have to add a li little bit here. Uh, 52,000 plus uh, 14,600. That's uh, 66,600. And uh, plus another 2,500 uh, civilians. Uh, that's uh, 69,000. What happened to Yang? Three weeks ago now, uh, M. Yang uh, was on one of these defoliation operations in front of the troops. They hit a mine and blew up. Two were killed right on the spot. Seven were seri uh, seriously injured. Yang was one of, one of those. What she's saying is that they're used as human mine detectors. <clears throat> they have to clear the minefields. That's really what it amounts to. Uh, it, uh, uh, this comes as something of a surprise to us, but now in finding out about her and inquiring around, we've found that there are a number in the hospital just like her who've also been forced to go out and around the perimeters of outposts clear away brush in areas that are heavily mined. I asked her, why did you go and help out with the operation? She said, uh, well, if we didn't go, the soldiers would beat us. Uh, and so everybody has to go. Uh, Earl Martin is another kind of American who has lived and worked with the Vietnamese. He took me to a refugee village called Son Tra. Here, almost everybody is starving, regardless of the thousands of tons of food which leave the United States and Saigon, but seldom get here. Vietnam has always been the rice bowl of Asia, and hunger is one ordeal they've never known. Sorry about all the kids tripping us up. He's just saying that the reason so many kids are following us is because they think we're going to give out some food. Uh, he keeps yelling to them that, no, indeed, we're not going to give out any food, but they keep following anyway. Has the food situation improved here at all since the ceasefire? Well, the people have been here for since 66, and they've always been eating very little. But by and large, the, situation is, the food situation has gotten even worse since the ceasefire. Uh, people are a lot hungrier now than they were a year ago. Yeah. What is that, Earl? What is, what is it? It's the fully no, uh, sweet potato plants. No, uh, no, uh, I asked him if the ludicrous question if it's good. He said, uh, of course not, it's not good. Uh, but we're hungry, we have to eat it. So this is the village food supply at the moment. Isn't it? This is what the people eat. The Saigon Army outpost is not defending the villagers from an enemy. It's preventing them from going back to the abundance of their rice paddies just three miles away in so-called enemy territory, although the villagers might have another view of who is the enemy. Even their fish harvest is in danger. Fish in the bay have been poisoned by chemical pesticides dropped by American planes. And further out to sea, the fish can't be reached because there isn't enough petrol for the small boats. Graham Greene wrote his novel, The Quiet American, here at the dear old Palace Hotel in Saigon. Greene described a type of almost lethally innocent American official whose aim was to sell the American way of life to the Vietnamese, whether they wanted to buy it or not. Under Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy, the quiet American became real and multiplied, passing out millions of dollars and favors and portable flush lavatories and weapons and arranging the quiet extinction of those who opposed the regime they wished to set up. But somehow it all got out of hand, and 53,000 Americans and 2 million Vietnamese were dead. Now the quiet Americans are back, doing almost exactly what they did 10 years ago, passing out millions of dollars and favors and arms to a client regime they wished to prop up. How ironic it is. It's all come full circle here. It's all back to where it was when it began. We definitely are vital at this stage. Uh, they're in a transition period, trying to uh, make something of a growing country. And uh, we just will help them until we feel that they can handle the uh, situation themselves. And at, I'm sorry. And at that time, we intend on leaving. Yeah. My plans are to export, I believe, 
I'm, I, I want to export Vietnam products, and I think we can do it. Also, I would like to install in-country security systems, electronic types. Round and round the garden goes the teddy bear. An American embassy official arrives at a Saigon orphanage to award the best child of the month prize. All the children here are bastards of the American war, for which the embassy will do nothing, except, of course, to provide that free ice cream for the lucky prize winner. What about this little one down here? Oh, she's been here only about uh, three weeks now, I think. Yeah. Um, she was found abandoned uh, on the streets of Saigon, and some yeah. taxi driver picked her up and took her to one of the Vietnamese hospitals. Yeah. Uh, and she's totally abandoned. We don't know who the mother and who the father. Well, the father is an American, obvious GI, and yes, obviously. Hmm. What's her name? Wow, H-O-A, wow. that means she's a lotus, lotus oh. flower. I'm wow. Wow. Victor, you've written a report on all these children. There's one on Kong here, which I think I'd just like to read, because I think it sums up a lot about the children who are left after this war. Yeah. It says, now about the mother, it says she was a smack girl, that's a bar girl. Bar girl right. She met him, the father, in 1969, a G.I. They fall in love each other. This is written by Vietnamese. They stay together illegally. She has a son. When she was pregnant, her husband left Vietnam. His friend pitied on her and helped her. Later, they stay together as husband and wife, and she delivered another child. Both of her two children are black. She did not know the name of the second husband. Now the mother earns money as a prostitute. She's in debt, but she said she dare not ask for more. The only one thing she hopes for is the health of her children. Her youngest child is two years old now, father unknown. How long do you think Vietnam will produce orphans? Can you see in a few years' time that you won't be having orphans here? Oh, well, <laughs> there again, it's a very difficult question, I suppose. Um, hostility still continues, and uh, orphans are being made uh, every day. So as long as this kind of uh, situation continues, I think the need for uh, child care assistance is going to continue in this country. And uh, we are here only to go on helping as long as the help is needed. just the same as before, only the uniforms are different. And because the Paris Agreement says they shouldn't be here, an appropriate euphemism has been found for their work. The war that gave us ordnance instead of bombs, neutralizing instead of killing, has at last renamed the military, Management Services Division. These men are employed by the Lear Siegler Corporation and in effect run the Saigon Air Force. The Paris Peace Agreement was signed on January the 28th, 1973. Article 4 says, the United States will not continue its military involvement or intervene in any way in the internal affairs of South Vietnam. More than a year later, Americans are still here at the base at Da Nang, still playing their Saturday afternoon softball game. Perhaps someone forgot to tell them about the Paris Agreement. The guys of Management Services Division are all nice guys who never see the victims of the bombs and napalm dropped by planes which wouldn't fly if the Americans were not here. Get ahead now. Booty getting tired. Booty getting tired. Come on. Go away. Run on anything. Any hit. Booty getting tired. Go in there. We'll be the guy. There's a future for everybody here. There's no future here. The only future here is to make it while you can and get the hell out. Very few people are emotionally involved in the wars anymore. Yeah. Well, you, you, uh, both you people advising uh, the Vietnamese Air Force, uh, now, if you two left and people like you left, 
What chance would uh, they stand against? Uh, They'd fall on their ass. They could overrun this base, I'd say, in a week, wouldn't you? A good week. Uh, any any time they want, any place here, they'll take it. It's air to air. I talked to here is filled with gloom. They're either looking forward to leaving or they say that the, uh, the whole thing is going to collapse without the Americans. It's, oh. hey, knock it's not going to collapse. Knock that man in. You take a look. All they'll do is change their government. You take a look right now in North Vietnam. Your little mama son is still out there on the street selling her tomatoes. The country cannot work any other way. Your idea, or the American idea of communists, as applied to Asia, just doesn't, just doesn't apply. You, you, you have preconceived concepts, and they're out there. They're going to their schools. They go to their schools the same way. They run their markets the same way. All the changes is the guy in power. But doesn't doesn't this contradict the whole reason for an American presence here for the last seven, eight years? Do you think after all those years and all those deaths that it was worth it? No, I don't. Why don't you? I've seen the war here when I was here in 66 and 67. I've seen it here as a civilian. And I don't think it was worth it, no. Yeah, but you but haven't... But that, that's you, my opinion. But that's you haven't, opinion. you haven't lived with the Vietnamese. And I've lived with the Vietnamese. It's, it's my tax dollars going, no. too, though, see? Well. There's lots of problems all over. And there's too many Americans down on this country right here. Too many people, too many years, you know? It's, uh, there's lots of problems here. Could I, could I ask you, do you think it was worth it? Do you think that 52,000 deaths here was worth... 52,000 deaths. American were, deaths. Were 52,000 American deaths are less than we lose in traffic in one year. You don't even dead. miss it. But, but here you are in a it situation. It wasn't a great war, but it was yeah. the only war we had. Said it was on a morning when they were going out to cut grass and to harvest their rice like normal. And uh, at six o'clock in the morning the the cannons started blasting from the hill and then the troops came in rounded up the people in, in this area right right down along this stretch uh, and shot them rồi người té xuống và và kinh này dạ họ bán xuống cây này rồi trên đây cũng có dưới cây cũng có there was bodies in the ditch, bodies along the banks. His father, his mother, a younger brother and a younger sister were all killed. My Lai was the worst massacre of the old war and is now a symbol of the new war. A few days after we filmed there, it was a battleground once again. And once again, the survivors were refugees and moved down the hill. When American officials, those officials who are still in Vietnam and still doing so much to run the war for Saigon, come to a place like this, how do they get the optimism that still tells them that there is a chance still for successful American involvement in Vietnam? It seems to have gotten to the point where you've almost got to continue believing the story. You've almost got to continue believing the reasons for why you were here in the first place. Uh, uh, if after so much investment, 
and uh, so many American lives lost, we discover it was not really to help the Vietnamese people at all, but the total effect of it has been to devastate the landscape of Vietnam and to, and to have a scene uh, like we just visited uh, by the ditch at My Lai. Uh, if you have to come face to face with that reality, it's almost too much. Uh, so it's almost that you've got to continue believing the myth that it was good that we were here. There is a waiting list for burials at this military cemetery near Saigon. And these are the new graves of young Vietnamese soldiers killed in one week while we were there. There are 70,000 graves in this cemetery. That's exactly the number of dead in 16 months of peace with honor. <laughs> 